Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Lecture Series. Sit back, get comfortable, and let's go see what they have for us today. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another of the uh, Peninsula Seniors Lecture Programs. Uh, we're delighted to be able to uh, bring a uh, really clever and uh, extraordinary speaker who's going to talk to us about asteroids and space material that uh, may uh, be headed our way. And so uh, he's in addition, a longtime active member of the community, having been one of the founders of the Peninsula Land Conservancy, which you've been reading about. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Bill Ayler. Bill? Okay, well, let me just say uh, uh, thank you for inviting me to come and talk to you. I've actually spoken to this group uh, several times over the years, most of the time about uh, land conservancy things, but also uh, occasionally about space debris and asteroids and comets and things, and I'm happy to do that again. Um, I'm, I'm with a company called the Aerospace Corporation, and I know some of you <coughs> might be aware of that one. Uh, does anybody know what aerospace is? Okay, very good. Um, we're a, a nonprofit corporation that supports the National Defense Space Program, and some of you may wonder why it is that you know we're interested in asteroids and comets that I'm going to talk about here. And um, you know, it, it, I got interested in this some years ago when um, uh, our local Air Force was actually given a task, and they're doing this every now. They do this every now and then to see if the Air Force is you know ready to handle these things. And the task was that there's an asteroid headed towards Earth. What are you going to do about it? And uh, so uh, I was involved in the team that was helping the Air Force address that problem and uh, got interested in this topic at that time. And so and I've maintained that interest over the years, and uh, we've had several conferences on this. Uh, this particular briefing that I'm going to talk to you about here was one I prepared for a presentation in India. I gave it to an audience of about 2,000 people there. Uh, and um, this is a little smaller, but hey. And um, uh, so and I, you know, it, was, it was very interesting. At the end of the briefing, uh, I was absolutely swamped by young people, uh, students and so forth, who were asking all kinds of questions and so forth. So there's really a lot of interest in this area, and that interest, I think, fortunately, is growing. So let, let's uh, press on here. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is uh, some of the information relative to the, the, the uh, uh, work that's been done, what we know about the threat and so forth. Uh, we've had uh, now several conferences on this, and I've been chair of two of them and uh, co-chair on the last one there, which we had just recently. And um, we'll talk about what we know about the threat to Earth from asteroids and comets, uh, what would happen if we actually had a, an impact, uh, how you might actually deflect one of these things, because uh, it's inevitable that we will have to do that. Um, deflection, uh, there's more to deflection than just uh, sending a single thing up. What, do we, what does that really mean? What does the mission look like? Um, how do you mitigate a disaster from these things? And then what are some of the, the really hard issues, the political and policy issues that we have to address as part of this? Some people think it's really the technology that's the problem. It's not really the technology, and I'll explain why that is. So uh, should we really care about planetary defense? I'll tell you why I think we should. What's the nature of the threat? What can you do if we actually see an object? Uh, one of some of the non-technical issues, as I said, and then we'll talk about what's next. So let's talk about the threat. So if you want to click that figure there, this is a, uh, uh, a meteor event that occurred some years ago, back in 1992, as a matter of fact. And uh, this is one that happened here. And we have about anywhere from two to five events that actually uh, will leave uh, material uh, on the ground. And, uh, but we actually have about 10 to 20 of them every day that come into the atmosphere and where parts survive. Can you tell me why it is that we'd only be able to find, say, two, or five, two to five fragments uh, from that. They burn up. Well, actually, those, these are all the ones that survive. But wow. You can just play that one Why again. They go to the ocean. <laughs> See, that one hit a car, so I thought that was very... It also hit New York City, which is uh, interesting, but click it again, if you will. There you go. Now, just watch this one closely here. Actually, they land in the water. That's why we can't find them. But anyway, you'll see how this one breaks apart. This looks like a satellite reentry, too, if you ever see one of those things, and um, I can talk to you about that more sometime later. But this one uh, just came across the sky. Somebody actually had a camera out and saw it. And um, this one, uh, as you'll see, basically f flew over the, uh, uh, the states there. And, and um, a fragment came down and struck a car in New York City. So th the indication is that these things do happen, and they happen more frequently than you might think. And there's another one here. So if you want to click this one, 
Okay, this is, a, this is one that came down in Chicago or outside of Chicago. The story here is that this, was, this uh, video was taken by a, the camera in a police car 60 miles away from where that thing actually came down. And uh, that was the estimated, it was a couple of meters in diameter, which is, uh, you know, seven feet or something like that, and weighed about seven tons. And it actually fragmented. There were fragments from this one that went through a house and so forth. So uh, fortunately, nobody was injured. Uh, but it's just an indication that these things come down and some are big. So um, one of the most famous is uh, one that came down in uh, Tunguska or in Siberia. Uh, it's called uh, the Tunguska event. Uh, this was an airburst air, air burst of about a 50 meter object. Remember these sizes too, because this will be important later on. So we first saw that first one, that's two meters. This one is 50, and it uh, basically caused an airburst of, of uh, about six kilometers up, and uh, was equivalent to about a two to, two to five megaton now, we think, explosion. Uh, and it leveled about 2,000 square kilometers or about 500 square miles of forest. That's bigger than Washington, D.C. And so the, uh, the, the only reason that people weren't killed there is because there was nobody there. Um, and, uh, but that's a, a relatively famous event. It's an indication of the size of the disaster that you can actually happen. And I'll use this little pointer here to, just to show you. This is what the area that was covered. It basically f flattened the, these uh, trees here. And that's uh, the area of New York City and Washington, D.C. So you can see that this is an event that we don't want to have happen over a populated area. This was 50 meters. This was also about 50 meters. This was an iron uh, meteorite. This was a meteor crater that some of you may have seen. And uh, that's also an indication of the kind of disaster that you can have from these things. Uh, we've had other ones. So there, uh, there was, uh, in 1930, an event in Brazil that was in a very remote area. Again, it was a, looked like a relatively large uh, object came down. And there, here's some other ones that are more recent. Um, this is in March of 2009. There's a, a car in Cottonwood that was uh, in, in this particular newspaper, which I thought was kind of, kind of interesting. I mean, we have had these things hitting cars. I don't know if there's magnetism there or what, but... Uh, this is another one over Scandinavia where it actually hit a mountain and um, it lit up the uh, nighttime sky. Um, I don't believe debris was ever found from that one. Uh, this is another, another one that, was, uh, that came in and uh, hit with an impact comparable to an atomic bomb. And then in, uh, there are, uh, this is some, uh, a report that basically says that uh, these types of events when they enter the atmosphere can be detected by satellites. And uh, there were 136 of those, re uh, those types of events that were recorded between 1975 and 1992. So these things happen all the time. It's just little ones come in. You, some, some of these little ones that you see at night when you go out and watch and you watch a meteor storm, uh, something like that, you just, they're typically the size of a human hair or a pea very tiny little objects that come in. And when they get, uh, get up to around a few meters in diameter, it's, it's, much, it's not as frequent, but those are also quite dramatic if you can see them. And then fortunately, we haven't seen too many of these really larger ones, or say 50 meter objects, but we'll talk some more about some of these things. So this is an interesting article I saw just recently, and again, there's some debate about this, but this is um, some of these, one of the things about Earth is, you know, the, the moon doesn't have any atmosphere, so it doesn't really erase the, the evidence of events. Earth does. Our weathering process will em uh, erase the evidence that these events may have occurred. This is something that there's some theories on that uh, happened recently. This is about 12,900 years ago, uh, where there's some evidence that uh, an object came in and blew up over Canada. And uh, there was an ice sheet over Canada at that time, and this particular event is, uh, uh, the theory is that it actually melted some of that ice sheet, sent water out into the, uh, the meltwater out into the Atlantic, uh, stopped the Gulf stream, uh, stream at that point, and uh, caused an ice age that lasted about 1,000 years and uh, drop the temperatures in the northern hemisphere about uh, 10 degrees centigrade. And it's interesting that a uh, number of the large animals in the northern hemisphere, mastodons, saber-toothed tigers, and some of those um, ended their existence in, in the North America around that time. And so again, there's, this is, uh, these are uh, theories that are coming along. Scientists are out looking for evidence of this kind now. I saw another paper where somebody has found uh, some uh, mastodon skull and a uh, bison skull that's got buckshot in it, effectively. And um, there was no buckshot, but this is from thousands of years ago, further back than this. And of course, there was no buckshot at that time. And the speculation is that uh, something came in, exploded in the atmosphere, and then showered these uh, animals with, uh, with buckshot. 
or equivalent, small particles. So again, people are looking for evidence of uh, these kinds of events, and um, hopefully we'll know more about these things as time goes on. And these are some close approaches. These are things that didn't hit, and I thought these were kind of interesting, interested too, because these are really close. 26,000 miles uh, is a really a close pass. That's within the altitude where we put a number of our satellites, so that's a really close pass. Uh, we had a comet that did that here, uh, a 170 to 300 meter comet came by, and you'll note the megaton equivalent here, that's a, uh, a 15,000 megatons of TNT if that thing had actually come in any closer than that, or actually hit the planet. So uh, these, uh, these objects, they carry tremendous energy, uh, and uh, the, the uh, comets are particularly dangerous because they travel much faster than uh, your asteroids do. Um, for example, um, the Leonid meteor storm, uh, those comets were traveling at about uh, 70 kilometers per second, whereas a uh, you know, typical meteor re-enters at less than half of that. So uh, it's, it, there are really a lot of energy associated with comets, and they're very dangerous things. So what sizes of these do we really worry about? And this is an important chart. Remember this 50-meter uh, number? That was the one over Tunguska and so forth, and that's sort of at the low scale of this. They're relatively frequent. Uh, the chances of an event like that I'll talk about in a second. Uh, we get the Tunguska and so forth. It's, uh, again, not, not that infrequent, you know, typical every 250 years or so. Fortunately, these really large ones, like 10 kilometers and, and so forth, which would uh, do a lot of damage to our way of life, um, uh, are very rare, uh, millions of years between them. However, you know, these are what the probabilities say. It's a very rare event, but it doesn't mean that you can't have one or two of them uh, that can hit fairly frequently. So um, you just can't um, just look at the uh, statistics and the probabilities and say, aha, we're good forever. That's really not the case. So uh, this particular one is an interesting chart, and I'll tell you how to deal with this in a second. But basically, this is uh, a, a collection of events about what we know about the near-Earth object population. And what I'm going to show you here is um, a series of times. This, is, this is, begins around 1800. And uh, this is what we knew, of, knew about asteroids and comets at that time. Not very much, because we really weren't looking. We didn't have the technology to look very well and so forth. And uh, there wasn't much there. And, and, and what we'll do is, if you want to click, I think, probably the space bar. There we go. Now, if you click that one, that's what we knew at 1900. And you'll see we're beginning to see a few more of these things. Try it again. Hit space again. This is 1950. So we're getting to know more of these things. And here's Earth in here, by the way. Okay, next chart. Next one, I mean, yeah. And so this is a 1990, and you'll notice that these little red dots here now are Earth crossing. So these are the ones that really cross our, uh, our orbit, Earth's orbit, and they could threaten our planet. And so um, uh, hit the next one. 1999. And so you'll see we're seeing more of these things now. And I hit it again. And this is what it looked like in 2009. And so basically, these are, this basically shows what, what we knew at that time. The numbers have actually gone up now. We have, uh, I think it's like 5,700 or so near-Earth near near Earth objects that we know about, and probably around 900 and something that are called, uh, uh, well, close, close uh, that could actually pose a threat to us. Um, if we, what we're thinking about doing now is tracking things down to about 140 meters. So what we were looking here, uh, about here, is we're basically looking for anything about a, about a kilometer in size and larger. Kilometers, you know, roughly half a mile or so. So you're looking for something about a half a mile or so and larger. And that's what we're basically seeing here, although there may be some smaller ones sprinkled in there. But if we actually go down to 140 meters, then we'll see uh, potentially maybe 20,000 or so objects in this, in this field that would be a, a hazard, hazardous to Earth. And so basically, if you, when you, if I, I may come back one of these days and give you a, a presentation on space debris, but it looks very similar to this, except that what we've got is rather than Earth being in the middle and all this junk flying around it uh, on the space debris side, we've got uh, now Earth is one of these things orbiting the sun, and we are joined by a whole lot of other debris out there. I won't say Earth is debris exactly, but we're, uh, we're uh, uh, joined by a lot of other objects in orbit around the sun. Some of those could actually come back and hit us. And so those are the ones we worry about. Okay, so this basically shows uh, the, the history of detections since uh, 1980. Uh, interesting, 1998, 1999, Congress basically mandated that uh, NASA go off and look for these things. And Where you can. Uh, they d use uh, various uh, optical telescopes for that primarily, and, and there are Air Force instruments and others that do that. 
Yeah, the question is, where, do, where are these measurements made? Uh, they're made by optical telescopes, um, well, throughout the world, actually, but um, uh, the Defense Department has special telescopes that are used, and they can be tasked to go off and just look for things passing through uh, through parts of the sky, and that's, uh, those are the types of things that are being used. And there are new telescopes being, now, uh, being built now that actually have uh, more capability, than, uh, or actually finding these smaller objects. Um, what do these things look like? Uh, this is uh, asteroid Itakawa. It's a uh, uh, one that people claim looks like a, uh, a an otter, a sea otter. As a matter of fact, the Japanese have got some. You know, when they give little briefings, they put little ears and things on this. And but uh, it's a it's an interesting. Uh, and this is one that uh, the uh, the Japanese actually uh, landed a spacecraft on, and then ultimately it took off and uh, it's on its way back. We'll see if it, it. They've had some problems with it, but we hope it makes it. Um, this one is an interesting one here. This is a 54 by 24 by 15 kilometer, so it's really a big guy. Um, and it's got a 1.4 kilometer diameter moon. And, uh, and if you think about that, uh, that adds another dimension to the, uh, the problem of trying to deflect one of these things. Because uh, you could find out, if you go through the engineering and so forth, and you could say, aha, I know this guy's coming in here and I'm going to have to try to deflect it. Uh, you could find out if you go out there that it's got a companion or two that are also dangerous. And so you have to worry about what's going to happen with them as well or what you might find when you actually get out there close to them. So the message, one of the messages you'll need to, to hear from this is we need, to, we need to find these objects before we can even think about doing anything about them. And the more we know about them, the better. But this one would really be a problem. It's a big object. It would take a lot of energy to move something like that. And uh, that moon is not trivial either. Now, one of the things that's a problem, and, and, and again, from the standpoint of uh, dealing with the public, and, um, and I'll talk about this later on, but some of the policy issues associated with this is that you don't really know for sure that if you, when you see an asteroid that it's going to hit the planet. You'll know that there's a chance of it hitting the planet, and that's what this basically, basically this chart shows is uh, this is time before impact here, where impact is there, and this shows you the impact probability. So 40 years before, the probability was pretty low. This is uh, like one in a thousand, one in a hundred, that's a one in ten, and one up there means you're in bad trouble. So um, in this particular case, as we get more measurements, we're able to refine that probability down to the point where it actually gets to be uh, like one in two, maybe about, uh, say, 17 years before impact. That means we've got 17 years to do something about it. And, in, and that was this particular case. For some objects, it can be five years, seven years. And if it's a comet, it could be two years. And so that is one of the real problems from the standpoint of dealing with it. The other uh, problem is that uh, if, if, let's suppose our elected officials, that, that your job was to go in and brief Congress and tell Congress that uh, we've got an asteroid coming. The chances are it's one in a hundred. It's going to hit our planet. And I need to have $2 billion right now to get work started on building a deflection technique. And Congress says, well, you mean this 99% of the time we're not going to need, even need this thing? It's going miss to the, miss the planet? So, th so that's the issue, okay? We're basically, if, if you, you're betting the planet on anything you do in this area. So it's, you have to t treat it very carefully. Now this one, uh, let's see, now this one is going to play, but if you watch this one, um, and you can uh, get, find this on the web at, the, at a, a JPL, JPL website, but if you watch this thing, uh, this is an indication of how the, it might work for Earth. This was actually an encounter uh, of an asteroid on its way to Mars. Uh, this was back in uh, 2007, it was discovered two months before it might impact Mars. About 50 meters in diameter, so it's a pretty good sized object. The initial probability was about that it was going to hit Mars with a probability of about 1 in 350. Uh, after some additional measurements, it actually went up to 1 in 75. And then it got up to 1 in 25. So 1 in 25 chance it was going to hit the planet. And then after they got some more measurements, it dropped to 1 in 10,000, and it subsequently missed. But this is, an, this is an indication of the kind of problem we're going to have dealing with, with, with Earth. And you individuals will have an opportunity to affect, potentially, uh, your elected officials' vote on providing funds for something like this. And again, given the kind of problems that we have doling out money for anything these days, this is not going to be an easy thing to do. 
Okay, now this just shows you what uh, the intersection of a comet looks like with uh, Earth. This is uh, Comet Temple Tuttle. And um, this was, um, if you remember the landed meteor storms a few years ago, this was the comet that uh, caused that. And uh, this is just an illustration of how this thing works. Comets up here, and comets, as you know, they have this, this little tail here, and, and uh, they're always boiling off little uh, d debris and so forth. And so that debris then will follow it in orbit. And that's what you see here. So this little cloud of debris is here. Now, in this case, the Earth is coming by this way, the comet's going that way, and so we're hitting it nearly seven, uh, head on, and so that's one reason why the <laughs> velocities are so high with this one. As I mentioned, they move, that one is about 156,000 miles per hour, I think was the uh, uh, velocity of those fragments when they came in. And this just shows that it really is almost a, a uh, you know, we're almost hitting it dead on. Again, uh, when the Earth and this comet's tail are in the same place, uh, that's where you see these meteor storms. Now, this is an interesting chart because it uh, gives you a different perspective. Um, basically, from those two other ones, you can see that we're actually flying through the tail of the comet. Well, actually what happens is that you, you get sort of these multiple little tails. Um, when the comet goes by the sun, every time it makes a pass by the sun, it boils off debris. And when it made the pass in 1899, uh, it boiled off a little debris and it formed a, a tail that uh, the Earth passed through, if you will, or could have passed nearby. And uh, this, is, this is the path of the Earth through those various streams. So each of these little streams now exists along with that comet and the density of material in each of these little blobs is a little higher. And so what you would expect then, if you see the Earth going through November 17th, 18th, 19th, you'd expect to see that when we get close to this particular one, we see a little bump in the uh, number of objects going, we're going through, and similarly as we get a little further along. And that's exactly what was observed. This is information from observers, and it basically shows that we saw that. So in this case, the Earth is being used as a probe looking at debris in a comet's tail. So, uh, and this is a picture that was made from a satellite looking at uh, uh, entries into the atmosphere of debris from that comet back during that period. So I'll talk a little bit about comets here. And um, as I mentioned, uh, comets, uh, fortunately, we don't have a lot of them. They represent about 2% of the risk to, the, to Earth. Uh, but they, are, they, they have some unique features. Most of the uh, asteroids and comet, asteroids are more or less in the ecliptic, uh, so you, don't have, you can look in certain areas and see most of them. Um, however, comets basically can come from anywhere, and uh, they have very high relative velocities. I've explained that. Uh, the collision probability is very hard to predict because as you see these, this little outgassing and stuff here, that's like a little, that's a, those are little jets of gases that uh, are like what we use to control our satellites and move our satellites around. So this thing, as it moves, as it comes in and gets closer, will be outgassing and, it's, and it'll be moving around. So its orbit changes continuously. So predicting uh, accurately where that's going to come is going to be very hard to do. Secondly, since they travel so fast and they come out, they come from deep space typically, uh, the uh, warning time can be two years or less. And they also can be very big. So they, these are nasty little items. We're, it's best if we not see one of those for a long time until we get to the point where you know, we have Star Trek and we can go out and you know, beam them out of here, that kind of thing. <laughs> so what don't we know about these? Um, for on, on comets, we don't have precise orbits. And again, they're tracking errors. Uh, and all this is uh, actually for asteroids as well. We have uh, solar effects, for example, a, a sunlight shining on an asteroid. Actually, it's been proposed as a way of m moving an asteroid. So you, you can, uh, some people suggest that all we have to do is just paint an asteroid black or white, as the case may be, and, uh, and change, uh, change the way the, the sun interacts with it. And that would be a way to sl slightly change its orbit over time. And it probably would. Uh, some people say, well, maybe we could get you know, Sears or somebody to fund that. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, uh, that solar effect has to do with the sunlight shining on an object, and then the object rotates. As it, if it's rotating, that, uh, the lit area will rotate away out, out of the sunlight, and that it will still emit uh, some uh, uh, particles due to that uh, sunlight. And that will give it a very, very, very small force. But acting over a long time, it can have an effect. Uh, other types of things, uh, we don't know, typically don't know the size, the mass, the shape, or the rotation rate. Uh, and for doing, again, from the engineering perspective, you need to know some of these things because you have to design a, an object to go out and deal with it. So you want to have uh, as much information as you can get about the size and the mass in particular. 
shape and rotation rate you can uh, you'd like to know but you can deal with that if you have to and also some of the other properties uh, things like uh, you, you saw Itakawa there it looked like a um, it had a lot of rocks on the surface and so forth uh, there's some speculation that that's actually two large ob objects that forms the head and the body of this uh, of this um, a little sea creature, the otter, and uh, and and then it's it's very small gravity has just accumulated these other little objects on its surface. Uh, but if it's a, an accumulation of small objects, if you were planning to run into it with something, for example, or set an explosion off next to it, uh, the response might not be what you'd ex you expect. And so you need to know as much as you can about those things. Um, this uh, large body is held together. Is it a solid body? And also, if it's got a moon, that can be a real annoyance. Okay, so I thought you might find it interesting just to give you an idea of what the uh, probability of impacts are. And as I, you saw in that earlier chart, the probability of a dinosaur killer or you know, one of those large ones is about one in a million this century. Uh, the probability of civilization ending impact is about a one in a thousand this century. And something large about the Tunguska size is about one in ten. So, you know, I, when I talk to uh, young people about this, I basically tell those that are engineering and science people that, you know, it's not unlikely that in your career uh, you will have, a, have the honor, shall we say, of actually dealing with one of these things and designing a techniques and methods to go get one. Uh, so it's an indication that we really do need to be looking out for these things and, and, uh, and thinking about them. Now this is an, an interesting one. Um, I've talked to you about things that have been, and, uh, but this is one that's been found that's actually on its way. Um, this one is uh, called Apophis. It's the Egyptian god of death or something like that. And uh, it's named after that one. Poor choice of names, I think. Uh, <laughs> but uh, this one is going to pass very close to Earth. Uh, this, this is Earth here, this little figure. And that little, this trajectory here is the trajectory that's predicted for Apophis. This is for its pass in 2029. So it'll come within, uh, within our geo belt, um, which is within where your, the satellites sit that you point your radio antennas or your uh, television antennas to. It'll come closer than that in 2029. Its trajectory will be bent by Earth's gravity. And if it happens to get bent just the, uh, well, just the right amount, I guess is the way to put it, or the wrong amount, it'll come back and strike Earth in 2036. It's about a 300, it's a 270 meter diameter asteroid. And right now the probability of that happening is one in 250,000. It used to be a one in about 40,000. Additional measurements are changing that. Uh, but this is one, it's an example of the kind of things that we might be we might find as we expand our ability to search for these things. So again, if you have, uh, you know, if your people are going to be around in, uh, in uh, 2029, that should be a, a, a teaching opportunity there, I think. And um, we'll have, a, we, that, that, that'll, that'll come in very close. And again, uh, seven years later is when it would come back and hit. And we will need to make a decision sometime between now and probably this time as to whether there's a real danger of that happening. Uh, because if you wait until after it's passed and you said, aha, now I've got something coming, I've got to do something about it, you've only got seven years. And so, you know, if you, any of you people in the, have been in the space business, you know, doing something heroic in seven years is a real task. And uh, this would not be trivial. So let's talk about how we actually might deflect an asteroid. So basically, here's the, here are the basics. Um, you've got Earth traveling along here, and you've got an asteroid coming, and basically you have a problem when the two trajectories intersect, uh, and the, the objects happen to be at the same place at the same time. So your objective then, is, uh, as, a, as an engineer, is to move uh, one of these objects, and, and I'm not kidding, one of the students I mentioned at my discussion when in India came up to me and said, well, can we just move Earth? And so you can think about that one. But uh, probably our most, our most likely uh, opportunity would, or uh, activity would be to try to move the object. So anyway, you just want to move the object along its trajectory, uh, slow it down or speed it up typically, uh, so that it's not uh, where Earth is when Earth is passing through its trajectory. Now this is an indication, this, this chart just shows you that time is critical. And what you see here is this is days to impact. Uh, you know, this is, uh, well, uh, 4,000 days out here, and you go down to zero here, and this, uh, these lines you see uh, are the, uh, how much velocity you'd have to add to that, uh, or how much you'd have to change the velocity of that asteroid uh, as a function of time as it gets closer. 
And you'll see that out here you're talking about, oh, you know, gee, centimeters per second. Very small amount out if you catch it way out there. But as it gets in closer, it gets to be a little bit harder. And you get up to over 10 and then over 20 and then up to 40. As, you, as, a, as say, if you get down to a year or so, you've really got to put a lot of energy in there. And that means if it's a big object, it almost can be impossible. We may not have the resources. It may take more, uh, say, if you're going to say you use nuclear weapons, it might take more devices than we actually have on the planet to move it if you, if you have the right circumstance here. So you really want to see these things early to try to move them. And the other thing you want to do is try to re decide how much you want to reduce the risk. In this particular case, you're going from a case where it's actually going to hit the planet, uh, and you want to have it miss it by one Earth radius or move the, reduce the risk by to one in a thousand or one in a, one in a million. And you can see that depending on how much confidence you want to have in your technique, uh, you've got to put more energy in to get that. So basically, if you're going to have, uh, uh, do, do something here, you have to have time um, to, to plan and develop a, an approach. So you, so you have to know there's a threat out there. It has to exceed some threshold. And again, some of these thresholds we haven't defined. When I uh, was briefing once before and, uh, and mentioned the fact that the probability of Apophis, of Apophis striking Earth was 1 in 45,000, somebody said that's too high. So, I mean, basically, again, uh, are you willing to take a chance at 1 in 45,000 times uh, of, of a risk that small that the planet is not going to have an impact or something that's going to do tremendous damage? Or is it 1 in a million? Does that make you more comfortable? And these are the kind of decisions that uh, will have to be made in the case when, some, when something is actually, actually found. Um, we, we have to know things about the object size, mass, and orbit. We have to know, uh, have some mission concepts and technologies available to actually move something, and I'll talk about some of those in a minute. And that includes the launch vehicles. Uh, we'll talk about deflection technology. Just many people say, ah, we'll just go hit it with a bomb but, uh, or do something else. But the problem is you've got to get something to it, and getting it to it is not, is not a trivial. We can't use our, our land-based, you know, the kinds of missiles we use for defense and so forth because they can't make it that far. If we hit, wait until it actually gets close and we can send a space shuttle with, astro with, uh, with astronauts on it out there, uh, you know, that's way, way, way too late. Not really practical. So we want to get them much farther away from that. So we, and then we have to decide to act, which means you have to allocate funding and you have to resolve non-technical issues and time is going to be critical. So let's talk about some of the, the uh, slow push techniques. Um, the, uh, uh, and I, I think I should, I'm going to mention this. I, think. I haven't done this one in a while. So um, one of the things that you need to think about is this, uh, this reliability business. And uh, those of you in the space business know that your, uh, launch, your launch vehicle reliabilities are typically like one in a hundred now. If you're a commercial, you're putting a new commercial launch vehicles uh, up there, not as reliable as that. But some of these ones that we've had running for a long time, about one in a hundred is what you expect. And if you remember from the probability there, I said we want to take it down to one in a million. Okay. So you're going to take it and launch. You, launch one vehicle that has a one in a hundred chance of failing on its way up uh, to do that. Also, if you have a new spacecraft that you're putting in orbit, it'll likely fail maybe one in three times. So you have to factor all that into your overall campaign design. So you can't simply launch one vehicle to go do this mission. You have to launch a number of them to make sure you actually get one there that'll do the job. So let's talk about some of the deflection options. There are basically two types. There's a slow push. This is um, the slow push means that it's a small force acting over a long time, and uh, this one is um, uh, this is something called a gravity tractor, which is uh, an interesting concept. Uh, you basically got a spacecraft. You park it next to a an asteroid, and there's a very very small gravitational attraction between these two, and you just and if you park it in the right place and you let it sit there for a long time, um, the orbit of this guy will be affected by the fact that that's there and you can slowly move it away and your action time can be months on something like that. Now of course this can be uh, a challenge if that happens to be an oblong thing like um, you saw some pictures of uh, that, and it's also tumbling which is quite common for these then you've got hold a very close proximity. This works. The closer you get, the better. So um, you have to hold very close, close proximity to a tumbling object. That can be a non-trivial exercise. So there are a number of issues that have to be resolved. This is one that's been proposed. Um, 
and um, you know we'll see where that goes. This is another one. It's called a mass driver, and this is one where you'd actually land uh, these little uh, spacecraft on an object. There's a drill at the bottom of this thing, and it drills into the asteroid, extracts material, and then accelerates it out the top. And you can see these little jets going forth. And so that material leaving the asteroid gives it a little bit of thrust, and um, and that would be a good thing. Of course, one of the issues with this one is, again, if you've got a tumbling asteroid, you want to have that thrust go in the right direction. It doesn't do you any good to do it the other way. So you have to figure out how you deal with that. And in this particular case, their concept is they just use a slew of them, and they only fire the ones that are pointed in the right direction. Uh, some other slow pushes are uh, things like uh, a focus solar, which is where you use a large mirror to heat the surface. Um, the material, if you will, boiling off that surface gives it just a little bit of thrust, and so that can do you some good. You can do the same thing with a, with a laser. Uh, this enhanced Yarkovsky, this is where you'd actually change the albedo or the uh, reflectivity, and that would also uh, uh, potentially affect the orbit, but again, it's a very slow uh, effect. Then a space tug. This is where actually you'd actually take an, an ob uh, a spacecraft and attach it to an object and then use a thruster. But again, you've got the problem. If that asteroid is tumbling, uh, then you can only exercise that for a portion of the time. So kinetic impact is one we've actually, in a sense, tried or tested. It's the only one we've actually uh, tested we could actually use. And it wasn't tested to do uh, a deflection. It was used against a, uh, a comet to see what, would, what the material was. And this was a, a mission that went up some time ago. It was a high velocity impact, about 10 kilometers per second. So it was a, a, an object that was slammed into a, into a comet and um, it had an impulsive uh, momentum change. So it basically just hits it and you get a little, you know, it gives it a little nudge, just like a, a bullet hit in, hitting a rock. So you just move it just a, a little bit. And if you've got a big object, you'd have to hit it a lot of times. Um, then, uh, and then one interesting thing is you can get, uh, you actually get an amplification of the effect simply because when you hit it, you spew off a lot of material out of the crater. And that actually also adds to the effectiveness of that particular technique. But again, if you don't know what the materials are, you're not sure how, what that effect is, is gonna be. So it does affect the engineering behind this. So uh, we, uh, uh, Aerospace actually for one of the conferences did a, a design, uh, just a conceptual design of a, a, a vehicle to go off and get an object. Uh, we defined an object and I forget what its size it was, probably 200 meters in diameter or something like that. And we decided we wanted to go off and we we're gonna use a small nuclear weapon to uh, get it. And we designed a spacecraft that had a, uh, several components. This was the impactor here and this was a uh, carrier vehicle that actually had uh, some of the communications and so forth associated with it and they would separate uh, as you got in closer, and uh, this one would observe the effect. It turns out with uh, nuclear weapons that blowing a, a, uh, a device up on the surface or below the surface may not be the approach to take for a couple of reasons. One is that it would spew a lot of debris up, and so you basically get this cloud of material around the object, and it might, if, if you don't get the effect that you think you're going to get, it may make it harder to go get it next time. And again, the way to think about this is you might have to have a series of things going in to try to take something out, and you want to make sure that you can actually see the object you're trying to get, and if you blow something up on the surface, that may not be so good. Uh, or even below the surface. Both of those are pretty effective if you can do that. Another approach is to, uh, to uh, set off a uh, nuclear explosive above the surface. And in that case, the neutrons will actually heat, the, uh, heat a large area of the body and you'll get uh, uh, pieces, uh, small pieces leaving at that point and you get a small delta V out of it. It's not as effective, but it, it leaves the area fairly clean, which is kind of nice. And there are other impulsive techniques too, um, conventional explosives and of course nuclear, we've talked about that. Turns out conventional explosives are not, not particularly effective. Uh, so although I had uh, one of the conferences, we had somebody come in from the mining industry and they basically said that you know, what they would propose to do is um, you know, land on this thing, drill a bunch of holes, put some explosives around and they'd turn it to powder. So uh, a nice thought. Of course, the Russians came in with an idea to use a very large nuclear explosive that would do the same thing. So, so some of the engineering cha uh, challenges, uh, this, uh, this campaign has to have a very high probability of success, and that's what I was mentioning earlier. Uh, we've got a situation where uh, we'd be using, at this point, at least untested technologies. We haven't done this before. 
you'd have to use multiple launches, multiple uh, approaches. And one of the concerns you've had is we've had situations where we've sent probes to Mars and we've had a small error in some guidance uh, parameter that's caused us to miss the planet. Not a good thing. And uh, so you want to make sure that you, if you've got a team that's developing a system like that and it's got a problem somewhere in its system, that's, so it's not going to work, you have to allow for that. And so you might want to have two teams be developing uh, uh, an, uh, approaches and not talking to each other about specifics. And so um, that would be useful. So uh, this multiple techniques, um, if one of them doesn't work the way it, you, you hope, maybe you'll have time to try something else. Um, you don't know what the effect is going to be when you actually get there. Is it going to break into multiple pieces? Is it going to be less effective than you think? And then um, if you're doing proximity operations, in other words, flying up close to a, an object and flying around it, um, uh, how would you actually attach something to an asteroid? I had somebody come in one time and they, they gave a talk and they said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to attach this thing to this asteroid. And I'll say, we're going to fly up next to the asteroid, I think he said, and then a miracle happens. Ah. <laughs> and he said that. I couldn't believe it. Anyway, uh, so that... That one has uh, subsequently uh, not gone very far, um, but um, it's, it's interesting. If you're going to try to attack, uh, attach to a surface that you don't know what is, you don't know what the characteristics are, you don't know whether it's a rubble pile or what, that could give you real problems. And then we talked about uh, rotation, the materials and dust and so forth on the overall effectiveness. So again, there are a number of issues. And by the way, lasers, it turns out, if you shine a laser or you focus sunlight, like you use a mirror and you focus sunlight on the ground, um, that uh, uh, that kicks off a little little bit of dust and so forth, which will reduce the effectiveness of the of that particular beam, and so that makes that something you have to allow for as well. So you might have to cause the beam beam to dance around on the object to be able to get the effectiveness you need. So this was this gets back to what I was talking about earlier. Uh, this talks a little bit about uh, the probability of impact here, and again, uh, what we've got is we've got something where it's uh, a one in a hundred chance of hitting the planet. We want to drop it down to one in a million, and uh, this shows you what uh, that we need to do something here. We've made a decision that it's a one in a hundred is where we need to take some action. This shows you that. Um, if you use some of the commercial stuff that was developed during the better, faster, cheaper uh, time frame, this is something that those, those of you in the defense business will remember. The reliability of those, unfortunately, wasn't so good. And uh, so uh, if you use a military mission, you can bring it down a bit. Military uh, launches and so forth are held to a much higher standard. And then, uh, but again, you've tried to bring it down into this, this range here. And so it really is, is a problem if you try to figure out uh, how many launches is it going to take of something that has that kind of reliability to get it down here? And so it's, it's a very interesting uh, engineering issues here. So let's talk about some of the non-technical issues. Okay, so uh, what, I, uh, what I did before, and I'll just pose it here again, is that there's a, um, a scenario might look something like this. There's been a 140 meter object detected. It's got a one in a hundred uh, probability of striking Earth in 10 years. Okay, so that's, that's something, and it, you know, you never know. Uh, engineers tell us it's going to take us two years to design a mission and the vehicles and to launch the first wave of interceptors. So that, now you've knocked your time down a little bit. The transit time is a year, so it's going to take you a year to fly out to this thing to intercept it. Okay. The estimated cost of campaign is, about, is over $10 billion. And, uh, and so what do we do with that? All right, right now the question is who pays? And I talked to a, a legislator in the UK a while back, and uh, he says, oh, well, the US and the UK should just do this, you know? He, he thought that would be a fine idea. There are some people who think that, well, maybe, maybe it isn't the US's role to, to, to do this, or others who have space capabilities and so forth. But again, if you're trying to defend the planet, there are few, only a few spacefaring nations that could take a uh, task on like this. How do you coordinate that? How do you share the responsibilities? Those are going to be some very interesting issues. Uh, and then uh, who should take this action here? I mentioned before that you probably want to have two teams, but if you're going to do that, you want to make sure that you don't have one pushing it and the other one hitting it on the other side, if you see what I mean. So you, there has to be some level of coordination on that type of thing. And, um, and then who's going, to, who's going to do what here? So uh, there's some really interesting issues along that line. And then, of course, this, other, this last one, and some of you may think that's a crazy idea, but some people have suggested, well, well maybe there's some size of object. We're just going to take the hit. We'll just evacuate that area. 
where it's going to come down and, you know, be urban renewal or something, you know. And so uh, you just evacuate that area and then and take the hit. It may be, maybe doing that would be less expensive than trying to go off and hit it. And maybe f there's some size of object what that is. It's not clear what that size is, however. And so, again, there are a lot of interesting decisions that need to be made here. And then last one, I think this is really interesting. Who decides that an area is going to take a hit and that you're going to evacuate all those people? <laughs> and so, again, that's a, there, there are some really tough questions here that are not engineering questions. And so some of the, the, these uh, political policy and legal issues here, um, again, I emphasize this, but this is an effort that would have to be initiated without certainty. We wouldn't know for certain that this was actually going to actually come in and hit at all. And we may get fairly far along uh, on doing and developing our mitigation approaches and find out that we get new measurements and look at that, the probability drop is not, a, not an issue anymore, just like it did with Mars, if you remember that particular one. So that's something we have to think. In. So, so how, do you, how do you actually fund an effort? How do, you, how do you get support for this? Is this going to be the, uh, you know, the, the sky is falling type of thing, you know, where you're yelling wolf and, you know, and, and it doesn't happen? Um, this decision to proceed and fund the effort is, a, is really a political decision. It's not a technical decision. I mean, the, the uh, astronomers and engineers will basically lay the problem out, but somebody's going to have to make a decision to, uh, to expend the funds. It would be uh, something that would have worldwide issue and consequence if it hits. Uh, it have to be. Would, would the nation? Would one nation make the decision? Uh, for example, I, I saw uh, an article recently where the Russians now are looking at a mission to go off and, and deflect Apophis. So I mean, again, this is an issue where a coordination is useful, and the Russians have invited that type of thing. But they're looking at that. I don't know if they intend to do it, but again, uh, it's an issue to. Uh, it's it, it is an issue as to how this kind of thing would be done. And then how is this funded? I mean, again, since this is something that has worldwide consequences and worldwide impacts, how do you, how do you actually fund that? You know, do U.S. taxpayers pay for it? Is it shared among uh, a number of nations? How is that done? Uh, have to coordinate things. And, uh, and who's liable if it fails? Or let's suppose that you, post a, uh, you give a warning that something's going to hit in the Pacific. Ah, it turns out that the ground, ground track for Apophis, some have predicted, in 2036 will actually cross the Pacific which means that it could hit anywhere, you know, sort of all on the Pacific and, you know, and, and over other places. But suppose somebody says, well, you know, I don't want to live anywhere near that. I'm going to move away. I'm going to move to Arizona someplace. Does that affect property values? I don't know. So, so there are interesting issues there. Um, and then if, you, if something happens or it doesn't work, uh, is this gonna, are lawyers going to get involved and, and uh, you know, basically sue you because you failed or whatever? So, I mean, there's interesting things. And then false alarms. And this is one I think is really something to be considered. And you can tell from this idea that this, this probability of 1 in 100, there are going to be false alarms. That is going to be the, the character of this type of threat, is we're not going to know for sure it's going to happen. But we're no, we know something's coming, but it may in fact not hit us. So it may show a potential hazard, but it may not be. And that's the way we think most of these are going to be. Most of them will work out to be false alarms. That doesn't mean you can't do anything, though. Um, this timing, as I said, might force you to actually start building the capability because these things, you can't build hardware fast. You can't design a mission like this fast. And, uh, and so the, the question is, how do you actually take advantage of the fact that a lot of these are not going to be real? How do you develop a program which says, okay, I want to keep maintaining the technology, something that I can, that's more or less in the can, that I can pull out when I need it? Um, and then um, this evolution of the scenario, again, I think this Apophis uh, transit in uh, 2029 20, uh, is going to be a very interesting opportunity to explain to people what, how this sort of thing works and to teach uh, people about how the, the decision would be made and how a, a, a scenario like this will evolve. And then this timeline for critical technologies and decisions. How do you actually test these things? You know, right now we're not supposed to put nuclear weapons in space. How do you actually test a nuclear weapon on an, against an asteroid? Or, or do we really want to fund something where we plant an object, uh, plant something next, next to an asteroid or onto an asteroid and try to move it? So, um, and then 
how do we maintain the public and decision makers trust and and uh, and predictions and calls for action in a scenario like these and i think a lot of these are hard issues they will affect our, our ability to be successful and uh, and they are they are difficult issues to deal with so okay suppose there is an impact um, the result would be um, confusion at all levels of leadership delayed response because uh, people won't know exactly what happened. I mean, there's been concern, for example, that if uh, if a large meteor hits in the wrong place, it could actually be interpreted as a as a, a nu as a weapon explosion, a nuclear explosion. And if it happened in the wrong place on on the planet, it could be considered an act of war against some enemy. And uh, you got to be careful in how you interpret these things. So it could cause uh, a lot of confusion, uh, leadership. Uh, loss of life and suffering. I mean, uh, the there if it hits in the ocean, you get uh, tidal waves that can affect large areas, um, and not just one country. Multiple countries would be involved. You kick stuff into the atmosphere, which can, can affect our ability to communicate. So it can make uh, have some interesting problems. Uh, some of the recommendations are. Uh, and these are some from the conferences we've had, is that we actually include this uh, neo disaster in as a, as a, uh, uh, well, a, something to be looked at for these, uh, disaster, by these disaster response agencies. And they actually do have disasters that they plan with. They look at hurricane disasters and tornadoes and earthquakes and things. We've asked them to add uh, this type of disaster uh, to that suite of things that they consider. And there have actually been a couple of these now. So I think that's beginning to look uh, promising. And this uh, exercise, there actually have been, uh, as I mentioned, an exercise that was done uh, a couple of years ago on this area, and there are more coming. So I, I'm beginning to, th I think that people are beginning to think this, the leaders are beginning to think uh, more seriously about this problem. So what's next? Um, basically, we need to discover and track these objects that are smaller than a kilometer. Uh, and then there are certain resources like this Arecibo. Arecibo is a big radar, and it actually can uh, get you a lot of good information on something that's in the right range. And uh, things like, is it rotating, and how big is it, and those kinds of things. And so uh, uh, there's been some talk about shutting Arecibo down. We hope that doesn't happen. The, uh, these deflection-related re technologies, we need to have some way of uh, working those things test and testing them so we'll have confidence in them if we ever need to use one. Um, this mission and campaign designs, one of the things that would happen is if you actually had to do this, you'd have to launch, as I mentioned, more than one. Let's suppose you had to launch six launch vehicles, six big ones, six of the biggest launch vehicles we have. These launch vehicles are already being designed and being built for real missions here to put satellites in space. We'd have to deflect the, the uh, assembly lines for those things to, to uh, build those, those vehicles for this other use. What's that going to do to the people who have satellites to put up? And so um, there's a lot of ripples here that if you think about them, you know, if you're going to really dedicate that much resource into doing something like this, it's going to have its effects. So it has to be handled carefully, but we don't have any designs right now that talk about this, so we don't know exactly what those effects are. Uh, the protocols and thresholds for actions, this is something where, again, we need to have uh, international agreements in place. The UN now has got a group, now it's been set up to start working on some of these. This threshold for action business, is it 1 in 100, 1 in 1,000, 1 in 10,000? We need to be thinking about that. Um, we talked about adding it. Uh, watch this Apophis. This is one that you should just kind of keep your eyes on in the newspaper as we get as we move along here. It's uh, go to the JPL website. They've got a near Earth object page where they bring up. They show you all of the um, objects that we know about and they rank them uh, as to close their probability of impact and so forth. That's being constantly updated now. We've got a new satellite up that's actually looking for some of these things. So um, there's a, a lot of information out there. And then improving public understanding is really critical here. This is a different kind of a threat than we've ever seen before, and it's going to take a different level of interaction to solve it. Okay, uh, this chart uh, basically talks about things that we've done before. Uh, these, these conferences we've had here, uh, there was one in Spain in uh, April of 2009. And now uh, we've got another one coming in 2011 in May in Bucharest, a nice place for a vacation you're all invited. <laughs> and uh, so uh, that will be a, an interesting opportunity. What these actually have done, um, again, I, I, I started these things because I felt this is something where uh, a conference can bring people in the world doing this type of work together. Uh, and have some good discussions going, and that we could use these conferences as a way of sort of building our expertise, our capabilities, our understanding of this stuff. And it's really worked out very nicely. We're getting to see very nice uh, uh, papers. There's been some 
when we held this first one, for example, there was no one to call. If somebody did, saw a, an, a, an asteroid coming in uh, that was going to hit in the U.S., there was nobody to call. Now there is. So, uh, and, there, and there's a line to the president to inform the president about that. The, um, so again, these things are useful. There's, uh, we did videotape uh, the 2004 and 2007 conferences. That information is available at planetarydefense.info. And you can actually see each presentation. It's right there on the web. And we actually have videotapes from the 2009 one, but we haven't put those up yet. And again, I just gave you the website for uh, the JPL, but that's uh, neo.jpl.nasa.gov slash neo. Uh, it's a very good page. It's got a lot of information there, so I recommend you go see that one. Uh, the question is, do I sleep well at night in the, uh, you know, it's interesting, I work in the space debris world too, and one of the things about space debris, which I'll talk to you about sometime, is that uh, these things that you guys put into space when you were building spacecraft and things and launch vehicles, they come back, some of them do anyway, and uh, they also re-enter the atmosphere, they can do very much like you see here, they're fortunately they're very lightweight, but, um, you know, I've, I've told people at aerospace that they really ought to be wearing hard hats when they walk out the door because they have those things coming down every now and then. And, uh, and if you've been to visit aerospace recently, we've got a couple of pieces of debris that did re-enter. One came down in Thailand and the other one came down in Texas. 570 pound stainless steel fuel tank it landed, it landed in Texas next to about 50 yards from a farmer's house. He was not pleased. Made in the U.S. of A. on the side. Anyway, uh, so uh, that's, uh, these, these things do happen. Uh, so it, the probabilities are low. Um, you just can't worry about them. It's like anything else in life. So the question is, does st st stuff hitting the sun affect things? And it's, it's a good thing when it happens because it takes it out of orbit. So it means it's less, less of a threat to us. As far as I know, there is no real effect from that. I think there's uh, no consequence from that. The, qu the question is, do we keep track of that, and is it a uh, hazard to the shuttle and things like that? Uh, space debris is typically man-made things uh, that we've put into space, and the, the debris part means it's not operating. So it's, it can be dead satellites, it can be uh, dead launch stages, it can be things that result from explosions, collisions. We've had situations where the astronauts have lost cameras and tools, and they float off. That's now space debris. So... Uh, uh, and yes, in fact, it is a, it is a threat to uh, other objects, and we've had occasions where we have to move satellites to avoid, to avoid that type of threat. When John Glenn was up, if you remember, he went up in the space uh, shuttle some years ago, and while he was in orbit, they actually had to move the shuttle because something was coming close. The Air Force actually does a lot of tracking, other go governments do as well, and there are predictions made when something's coming close, and if it's, you've got a maneuverable satellite, and most of the satellites are maneuverable, Hubble isn't, but most are, um, then you can move, move your satellite. Thank you for watching Peninsula Senior Lecture Series. I'm Betty Wheaton. See you next time.